Welcome to The Melting Pot Live, Ian. Thank you for coming on. Um, maybe we could start by give you giving a quick intro of who you are and what you do and why cybersecurity is your specialized specialized subject. Okay. Um, we, I started um, ECSC over 20 years ago now. Um, I was doing a number of things at the time. Um, one of them was running a Cisco networking academy, which is teaching people how to um, build computer networks. So this was around about the dot-com time, dot-com boom time. And um, the thing everybody found really difficult was the security elements. So configuring security on these network devices seemed to be the, the most challenging thing for the, the, um, the attendees. And I found it quite easy. Um, so that made me think a little bit, um, and I was helping another organization, and they got hacked. And this was when people were first starting to connect to the internet, so people were doing it in silly ways and opening everything up to the internet and then suffering the consequences. Um, and I'd also finished an MBA and was getting itchy feet and thinking, well, maybe I'm, I now know everything about business, so I should start my own business. So there's a number of things that came together, but I was also advising government um, doing some work with GCHQ. Um, so doing lots of related things. And I thought, actually, I can pull all this together. And with the itch to start my own business, it seemed a logical thing to do. So at the time, it was called IT security, because it was really just the realm of the, the people connecting you to the internet. Then it sort of morphed into what's called information security, mainly around as an international standard um, called ISO 27001, which um, became a bit in vogue of people asking organizations to, to get that standard. But information security sounds a bit boring. Um, and um, But then it got rebranded cybersecurity, which sounds really exciting. So we, we, like, <laughs> we like to call it cybersecurity. And what um, you've, I mean, look, you've written some books along the way, not about cybersecurity, but about the, the human element of of risk or data data loss yeah the um when i did my mba i got quite heavily into psychology mm -hmm. and when i then started focusing more on what we now call cyber security there wasn't it was really being led by technical people technical companies technical vendors it people and yet when you look to actual breaches most of them had a human element and you can see that day to day in all the phishing emails that you get of people trying to trick you. Um, but nobody was really addressing that. So there were thousands of books on, um, on um, the technical aspects, but virtually nothing on the people aspects. Um, but I uh, had no intention of writing a book, but I used to do presentations on the, su on the subject. And I did a presentation and um, a publisher came up to me afterwards and said, you should write a book about this. Um, and I said, no, no, I haven't got time to write a book. Um, and he came to my next presentation and said, you know, you should be writing a book on this. And I said, no, I haven't got time. So he sent me a contract with an advance check. And I decided, OK, well, maybe if he sent me some money, maybe I should write this book. It wasn't a huge amount of money, don't get me wrong. Um, so it then took me four and a half years to write the book because I was doing it in hotels early morning and on trains and planes whilst I was you know, running the business. Um, but actually, I managed to do it, got it out, and it, it, it was very well received. Um, and along the way, in those four and a half years, I've been doing a lot of consultancy around um, what we call social engineering, which is tricking organizations, tricking people into either sending you information, causing a security breach, or, and also tricking your way into an organization to steal their information. So people were hiring us to do that. So having done that for you know, four and a half, five years whilst writing the first book, I then got a, a lot of case studies around from people saying, can you break in and get this document? We've got 100,000 employees um, and this document is only ever seen by 25 people um, and it's never printed out except individual paper copies that are getting, put in individual safes. Can you steal a copy of this? So projects like that. So I wrote the second book and managed that in nine months because the second one was really just telling stories of all the things we'd done on the back of the first book. Um, so yeah, so we, we, the first book is called Hacking the Human. And then imaginatively, the second book is called Hacking the Human 2. <laughs> um, but for a, for a general business reader, 
I would go with the second one. The first one is is really for cybersecurity specialists. It gets into some pretty heavy psychology and some some technical things as well. So it, it sort of introduces the human psychology into a technical audience. The second book is really case studies of what we did and where we did it. And, um, and it's a bit more accessible to the general reader. And whenever, it, it sounds like Mission Impossible, What's the what was the best, I don't know, maybe it's not best from their perspective, but uh, yeah, most ingenious, because it's like pulling a scam, isn't it? I mean, it's like yeah. it's like an episode of Hustle. The, the, <laughs> the best one, at one level, the best one was I got access to £16 billion. <laughs> um, right. But I actually just walked past the computer and noticed that the, the keyboard was a trader's keyboard. So in, in a city institution in London, the traders have a very specific keyboard. Um, so I spotted it was a trader's keyboard and there was a post-it note on the screen with a password on. And I tried it and it got into the trading account with 16 billion pounds of funds. So, so that was, a, if you like, the biggest prize, but that's not exactly ingenious spotting a post-it note. Although I, am, I had managed to get into their, um, into their offices. I guess that the best one was probably where we got access to this document. So big multinational company and their price strategic plan documents um, is only seen by 25 people in the whole global company. So most people know it exists, but they've never seen a copy. Um, so the first thing we had to do is get on site and they had a barrier system. Um, and we actually like electronic barrier systems in organizations because once you're through them, we've never failed to get through one, but once you're through them, everybody's really trusting because you must be who you imply you are, who you say you are, because there's that barrier system that stops people getting in. So once you're in, you must be trusted. So it actually yeah. makes it easier to get through those. Um, but we um, we had to work out a way to get through the barrier system. So we, we, we actually did it via the employee bus. So the company puts a bus on from the nearest city centre. And we hung out in the coffee shop next to where the bus pick, picks people up. We photographed people's badges because they were already wearing their badges to get into the organization. So we photographed some of those from the coffee shop early morning, um, created fake badges. So we, when we were on a job, we would always take all the equipment to print off fake badges. So we could equip ourselves with badges that look like employees, then hop on that bus because the bus driver is not trying to prevent people entering the bus. Nobody would get on that bus accidentally or for malicious reasons. So it's assumed anyone getting on that bus must be an employee. And then the bus, um, when it arrives in the morning, actually stops at a back, a back gate. And the security guard is there, but he's basically letting people in. So as long as you get off the right bus at the right time and walk in the right way and look like you are an employee, the security guard's job is to let you in. That gets you into the organization. Yeah. Um, then we've got to find this document. So I headed to the executive suite thinking, well, they'll have, a, they'll have a copy. And I used to have quite a lot of success in tricking secretaries and PAs. Um, I once got the chairman secretary to give me a list of all the executives with all their usernames and passwords. <laughs> and very helpful. Um, but in this case, the, the executives weren't there. But I talked to the PA to the CEO and I got on the conversation of this document. So I said I was actually there to do some checks around, um, around document security and I was interested in how this document is kept secure. And, um, and she says, well, I've never seen it. She said, it, th there is a copy and it's in the CEO's safe and I don't have access to that. So I thought, well, this is a bit of a dead end. Um, but then she said, would it be useful to talk to the people who write it? Uh, so I said, yeah, I suppose it would be really. So she takes me around the corner and knocks on the door. I don't know if it was a secret knock or just a standard knock, but she knocks on this door and you can hear the key in the door. So these people keep the key in the door lock when, even when they're in the room. The key <laughs> and this, this, the, the key turns and the door opens and somebody peers out. Well, of course, what they met with is the peer to the CEO with me and saying, introducing me and saying, Ian needs to talk to you about the strategic plan. So they say, oh, okay, and open the door and let me in, and she walks off. So I've now been introduced by the CEO's PA, um, and they're obviously going to be compliant. 
Um, and within 10 minutes, I had a copy on a memory stick. <laughs> but simultaneously, um, my um, colleague Lucy, who's now my chief operating officer, she'd went down to, so she'd, she'd gained access in the bus with me. And she went to speak to the IT administrators um, because she thought there's probably is an electronic copy and it's probably secured somewhere on the network. So she went to talk to an IT administrator um, who along the way told her where it was stored, this super secret plan. Um, and she tricked him into giving her um, his username and password. <laughs> so she later could log on as him and get access to it directly. So we, we both got access um, within about, um, I think it was about two hours from getting on the bus to when we both had a copy. And so from, the, from your client's perspective, was that a success or a failure? Well, the, the client, it was interesting that the, um, you, one, of the, one of my criticisms of that piece of work is that you, you're often commissioned to do it, but what's the risk of it actually happening? And, and I used to turn work down because you'd get a very enthusiastic um, cybersecurity person who'd want to do this exercise, but the company and its competitors in the sector had never had any, anyone do that to them before. So I used to challenge them a little bit. Is this really worth doing? Because is it a realistic risk for you? Now, in some cases it is. Some organizations are targeted by journalists and competitors and they'll do that. So anyway, I was presenting to the board of this multinational company. And I, I thought that they, they might question if it was a valid risk. Um, and the chairman started by doing that. He said, he said, well, it's very clever and I'm very impressed with what you've been able to do, but realistically, is anybody gonna do this? And then the, um, the CEO said, well, actually the reason we brought Ian and his colleagues in is because we've been told by our spies in our number one global competitor that they already have a copy of this plan. So we want to know how easy is it to get to it. Um, and, um, and then the chief operating officer said, well, in my younger days, I used to climb in through the windows of our competitors at night and steal their documents. <laughs> <laughs> so within five minutes, they'd all agreed that actually in their industry that these things do happen and people are trying to steal these documents. And, and this document basically maps out some key strategic decision making for the next 25 years for them. So it, it is quite, um, quite valuable to a competitor because it really gives you an idea of, of how they see their global marketplace going and, and therefore what strategic choices are they making. And so um, I thought that was a good story to start with because it, that it takes it away from the this is all about people and you know your IT department locking down your routers or your switches or you know putting patches in. If you if you think about the work that you now do at ECSC, what you, you mentioned um, phishing, what, what how should people be thinking about threat and risk and response? Where, you know, how much of it is people and how much of it is, you know, IT security? At one level, it's, it's all people mistakes, but it's, it, it tends to be mistakes in two areas. One mistake is the technical team make mistakes. So they open something up to the internet or um, by mistake or something that's connected to the internet. And they're not maintaining it as well as they should be doing. Um, so, so the IT teams make mistakes and the hackers spot those mistakes. And then general users make mistakes generally by clicking on phishing emails. That's the, the most common thing. Um, but sometimes users will cause breaches because organizations let them use their own personal computers for work, which is a big mistake. So, so but it, it's all connected with people getting things wrong. And one of the myths in, the, in cybersecurity is that people have this belief that the hackers are sat there having a, a morning huddle deciding who we're going to target today. Um, and the danger of that, even if some hackers are having a morning huddle to decide who do we hack today, um, it leads you to believe that somebody else is a more valuable target, therefore this is going to happen to somebody else. Um, and the reality, we've been recovering people from breaches for 20 years um, in our incident response service, and every single breach is caused by a mistake that the organization's made. 
So, so you just don't come across breaches where you go, oh, the hackers have targeted you and look how super clever they are. It's always, this is the mistake somebody made and look how easy it was for the hackers to exploit that mistake. And so from an IT perspective, basically they're running port scanning or vulnerability scanning across the world. Yeah. And if you've got an open door, it's a matter of minutes before somebody spots that you've left the door open. Yeah, and, and it can be that you've left that door open. And as you say, people are scanning the internet looking for these open doors. But it equally may be that that thing has to be open, um, but it's inherently insecure because there's a new way being discovered today to hack it. Right. So when we, when we started, the, these new ways to hack systems, um, which we call vulnerabilities, um, there were a couple of hundred new ones discovered every year. So we used to meet every week to look at what's new that's been discovered this week. So, so let's say you use a certain brand of, of email server, then that email server may have a vulnerability discovered this week that it didn't have last week. So you, you have to be open to the world to get your email, but there's something inherently wrong with that system now that's been discovered and hackers know that. Um, those now are at the rate of about 20,000 discoveries a year. Right. From a couple of hundred. So you're talking about 50 plus things per day, which will be new, the newly discovered ways of hacking. So you may have a system that was secure yesterday, but is vulnerable today. So the hackers are looking for you making a mistake and opening something up, but they're also looking for, oh, we've now got this new way of hacking this system. Therefore, um, let's scan and see who's using that system. Um, and then we'll we'll go and exploit it. And so that's why something like an annual penetration test used to maybe made sense, but now makes no sense, I guess. Yeah, there's a value to an annual penetration test where a company like ourselves will will really play the role of the hacker and 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 try and hack in and then give you a report on on whether it was possible or not. Um, there's, there's value in that, but yes, when the hackers are looking at things every minute of every day, if you make a, a mistake in March and your <coughs> annual penetration test is in September, then you're going to be hacked in the meantime. So what we always recommend is that people run those scans that the hackers are running, and we, we can do this for people as a, as a managed service, but they can do it themselves as well. But, but run the scans that the hackers are doing all the time. Um, to spot the things before the hackers spot them, and then you can address those. Now, that won't mean you are perfectly secure, and it's not as good as the penetration test, but it means you'll spot the mistakes. So, for example, if, you, if you're doing any changes to your IT that could make a change to what's visible to the hackers, then run a scan. Run a scan before you make the change. Run a scan when you've made the change and, and understand the results to say, have I, have I, made, have I done something wrong here? Have I made a mistake when I'm doing this reconfiguration? Um, so, so yeah, regular scanning is just smart and it's not very expensive. The, 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 there are free tools that can do it. And if you want a one with a bit more capability, you're not going to pay that much. You're talking about, you know, a business spending hundreds of pounds a year to regularly scan themselves. Whereas a penetration test would tend to be into the, into quite a few thousand pounds. Okay. Um, and that's, that's the sort of, firewall layer that you're testing it's it's like where your business touches the internet and you're saying yeah. have we left any holes yeah i mean in a traditional environment yes you have a device called a firewall that controls what can be seen and what can't be unfortunately now that that visibility that you used to have control of is now getting dispersed out into what we call the cloud so whereas you might have had your internal systems really just closed off and you had to be on your network to visit those systems more and more companies are moving those systems out into the cloud and they can be behind other people's firewalls or sometimes they're in the cloud and there isn't a firewall and people assume there would have been and there wasn't so when you start pushing things out into the cloud you're generally making them a lot more visible to hackers so we do find a big proportion of cybersecurity breaches are actually as part of people's cloud journey. So they're either building something new in the cloud and because it's new, 
they make mistakes and those are costly mistakes because those mistakes are visible to the hackers or they take a system that was traditionally internal and probably always had security issues but because it was inside their network the hackers couldn't see it um, and then they move that out into the cloud and suddenly it becomes um, visible to the hacker and then they get hacked or, um, or, or they're using or they've moved their business process to some SaaS solution Yes. And, and that SaaS provider has a data breach and their passwords are compromised and their SaaS provider may or may not tell them. Yes. So, so you, uh, a lot of people make this assumption that these new high tech cloud provider companies must be good at security. Um, and you just can't make that assumption. So the assumption that somebody's good at security because they're big, that, just it doesn't apply big companies struggle with security and assuming that somebody must be good at security because they're running their business in a software as a service model therefore they must have done security well then that's a dangerous assumption as well um what you what you often find is that providers of software as a service they've got a, a, a core skill set so let's say a common one would be a hr system um they're probably fantastic at HR and they've got a long track record of producing HR software. So they're good at producing the functionality and the processes that you need to manage a HR team. Um, but then suddenly they're moving to be an online business. Well, that's a completely different skill set. So the skill set to produce that software and send you it on a DVD every six months with the latest update, the old model, you needed to be experts in making functional software. Now they're an internet facing business and they need a really different skill set. How do you secure all that data online? Now, some companies make that transition really well and others don't do it very well at all. Um, so you just can't assume because they're experts in their subject matter, but they're also experts in online security. So companies are having to learn very quickly um, that servicing your customer base online requires that new skill set of, of cybersecurity. And that's why we're getting issues with um, the Internet of Things. So more and more things getting connected to the Internet. Um, the companies, so, so the, 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 the sort of stereotypical one is the fridge. So your Internet connected fridge, which will automatically order food as you consume it, um, which I'm not sure exactly what the value of that would be. Um, but it's touted as one of the examples of the Internet of Things. So more and more devices around the house getting connected to the Internet. But imagine that manufacturer who's got many years experience in making fridges, but they've got zero experience of how to connect something to the Internet securely. Um, and they'll tend to make mistakes. So as cars get connected to the Internet and household devices, these things tend to have security problems. Um, we well, there was, a, there was a, I think there was a thing like, I remember reading last year where somebody had driven up alongside a particular car and had, you know, made it stop or turn its lights on, you know, like things that I think they connected via Bluetooth and did sort of all sorts of random things in this car, much to the consternation of the guy driving the car. Yes, the, the, the first set of vulnerabilities in cars were from the DAB radio. Right. The DAB radio tended to be a route that you could get into the car systems. And the big problem with a car is that they they've integrated the system so the entertainment bit of the system where you're connecting your mobile phone and where you're viewing maps so the the thing that's communicating with the outside world is also connected to the car's control systems and you know that they're connected together because you have one screen in the car that you can be listening to your music and, and, and on your phone on that screen and you click a button and then you can be adjusting the settings of the car, maybe the suspension settings or the drive settings. So because you're doing those entertainment and car control things on the same screen, they must be connected. Now, if you were gonna design it in a smart way, you would actually have two screens in your car. One screen would be to control the car and the other would be to control your entertainment. And it would be on separate screens because the two were kept separate um, in the same way as um, we're doing a project at the moment with um, providing cybersecurity into some ships and, and ships have learned that lesson. These are these are um, ships that the general population can go in. 
Um, and, um, and we've done testing in things like cruise liners and things. And, and they tend to be a bit smarter that they, they know these are the control systems for the ship and these are the entertainment systems and they're completely separate and they don't try and mix the two together. In the same way on an aeroplane, you want the, you want the telephone and the, the Wi-Fi and the things that the passengers are using to be separate to the control systems that the pilot's using. And, and you start to mix them together, you'll tend to have security breaches. Uh huh. Um, what, um, you know, so we've talked there a bit about there's sort of a physical security layer inside the organization. And then there's, you know, do you, do you scan? What do you do to understand whether you feel that your SaaS providers are secure? Or do you do you get them to certify? Do you is there a do you monitor something that says that they've been breached and you should change your password? Do you do you should if you're a small if you're a business owner, should you scan your SaaS provider? Do you do you yeah. try and break into them when you do your annual assessments for people? Um, it's difficult because a lot of companies don't um, give you information about the security. So they say we can't divulge details of our cybersecurity for security reasons. Um, other companies won't let you test them, and you can't go doing security testing against a company without their permission. Um, we've got quite a clear law in the UK called the Computer Misuse Act, and it says if you do something against somebody else's computer, a computer you don't own, if you do something against that computer you haven't got authorization to do, then you're breaking the law. Okay. So you can't go testing people without getting their permission. And a lot of these companies won't give you that permission. Um, so generally, the way things are working now is that they will publish some sort of documentation around their security. And more often than not, they'll get some certifications. So a, a part of what we do is to help organizations get certifications. So if you want to operate online, so let's say you've developed HR systems and you want to move to software as a service, there's, there's two or three really good certifications that will help you to demonstrate that you're competent at security. So that's how it normally works is you use the external certifications to say, look, I've got these third party certifications that are independent and valued and recognized in the marketplace. And because I've maintained these, then you can have, you can have the confidence. Um, if it gets to the point where they've had a breach and your username and password have been compromised, it's, it's really too late then. And organizations find it difficult to recover when something like that happens. Um, which does lead us on to one of the, the biggest mistakes that users make, which is to use the same password on multiple systems. So if you, if you routinely log into 10 different systems, you should have 10 different passwords, because otherwise you're at the mercy that if one of those systems gets hacked, your username and password, the hackers will try it in other systems. So, so if, if usernames and passwords ever get compromised by hackers, they'll straight away look at eBay, um, try and log into Facebook, um, try and log into, um, you know, try and shop on Amazon. So all the places where they can conduct fraud and, and, and um, steal money from you, um, they will try that username and password in those situations. Um, if you've got a different one in every system, you're just reducing the risk that somebody uses that password. Which brings us back to people. And I was going to say, what do you do internally about people? So there's one, which is mandate, train, test to see whether your employees have the same password on multiple systems. And what about phishing though? You said earlier that you, th that that was, is that, if I'm a, if I'm a business and I'm at risk, is, is my risk really mostly from phishing? Do you think, or when yeah, you see the, when you on, see the breaches? Yeah, it does depend on the nature of what you do and, and how exposed you are to the internet. Um, but the, so the number one breach we deal with at the moment is organizations move their systems into the cloud. Um, so let's say they move it to Microsoft Office 365. Um, and they implement that, that login with just a username and password. And they don't use what's called multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is the fancy word for something happens with your mobile phone. So you try and log in and it sends a message to your mobile phone or there's an app or there's something interaction that happens with your mobile phone. The simplest ones just send you a text message with a code and you have to type that code in. And you see more and more sites like online banking start to use those sorts of systems. So this is really saying if somebody gets hold of your username and password, 
in order to log in as you, they also have to have stolen your mobile phone, which is very unlikely because the criminal gangs sending phishing and, and tricking you into giving you username and password, they're normally located in another country um, and they're not going to simultaneously steal your mobile phone. But if you move your IT systems into the cloud and it allows a login without using the mobile phone, then the executives become a real target. So they will tend to hack, um, trick the CFO, the CEO. They're looking to attack the most senior people. Often they'll attack the CFO because it allows them to start doing payment fraud. Um, so if you've got access to the CFO's email, you can then start targeting some of the suppliers and people that transactions happen with and trick them into sending it to the wrong bank account. Um, so that's a key target. Um, if you get to the CEO's email, you often get a wealth of information that you can then hold to ransom. So the so executives become a, a key target for these phishing attacks. Um, so if your IT team are letting you log in across the internet with just a username and password, they've, they're, they're making a serious mistake. Um, but the providers let you do it because it's convenient and it makes it easy to move into the cloud. Um, but that's number one mistake people make is having these logins that rely just on a username and password. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say that, you know, the executives become targets because so often the CEO is the person who resists most having two-factor authentication because it just makes his life or her life complicated but yeah. it's really hard for the IT team to mandate it for everybody else if the CEO isn't doing the same thing. Yeah, and that's sometimes where having an external expert that you're paying for, the directors can listen a bit more when you when you explain the risk. So, so sometimes it, it's that you explain it in a way they can understand. Sometimes it's because you're the external person advising them that they take more notice. And sometimes the technical people they're not very good at talking to management. They, they, they talk too technical. They, they use technical jargon um, and they've got the right intentions, um, but management just don't understand the words that they're using. Um, but coming back to the, the user education, um, the biggest mistake we see there is because that user education is, is often given to the technical people to make decisions around, they overcomplicate it and try and teach the users too much. So you get right. users doing really long training courses with lots of exams at the end and, and, and checklists to make sure they've understood it. And they, they're teaching in the wider aspects of, of cybersecurity. So for example, when GDPR came into law, you'd get GDPR sessions of trying to teach people the different aspects of that new law. Um, and for most users, it's completely irrelevant. They don't need to know that. Um, users need to know a very small number of things and do it really well. So users need to know how to spot phishing and understand what people are trying to do by conducting phishing against them. They'll need a bit of training around using their devices, um, simple things like not putting your password, writing it down and putting in a bit of paper in the same bag as a laptop and things like that. Um, and so they need a little bit of help on use of passwords use of the devices, what, what not to plug in where, et cetera, um, and then training in phishing. So you, for, for what users need, you, if you can't get it onto one side of A4, then you're making it way too complicated for those users. Do you, do you like password managers to make it easy for people to have multiple passwords for multiple systems? Or do, do you like... feel that that makes it really I like password managers if they come in the form of a little book with a pen. <laughs> okay. Right. The, you know, a, I, I, that, I'm amazed because I thought that, but, but what you're saying is, look, these, the people who are trying to hack you are in some foreign country and yeah. they're not going to have your mobile phone or your password book. Just yes. don't you put see, it in the same bag told, as your laptop. Yeah, we've been told for years, don't write your password down. Yeah. Um, but, but actually, that, that's, that's really bad advice. When you only had one password to remember, if you remember in the days when you, were, you had your first login to a computer, you needed one password, then people had never, never had to remember passwords before. And they were told to make it complicated. The IT team says, don't make it memorable, but make it complicated. Put symbols in and numbers. And, and so people started writing it down. And, and where do you put this bit of paper 
with your password on. Well, you do like the, the trader did, you stick it as a post-it note on your computer or you put it with your computer. So that was really bad. Writing your password down on a bit of paper and leaving it with the device is really bad. But now we've got a situation where your average person might have 200 passwords because so many things you do online ask you to create an account with a password. So they've been told you can't write passwords down and they've now got hundreds of passwords. They can't possibly remember them. So they start using the same password across every system and that causes so many breaches. So much better to have a different password for every system and write them in a little book. Don't leave the book next to the computer. Don't put it in the computer bag, keep it separate. Um, so, so writing down passwords is actually really smart because it then, it then allows you to have multiple passwords for multiple systems. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Now, the IT vendors and technical people then came to that you said about password managers. So they said, well, I've got this complex problem of remembering all these passwords. Why don't we do it on a computer system? Why don't we let the computer remember all the passwords? Now that's okay but it is putting all your eggs in one very dangerous basket. So when a provider goes, hey, I'm a cloud provider and I will store all your passwords for you. Um, and then you go, well, what about your security? Oh, I can't tell you about our security, but it's really, really good. Well, you can imagine that I'm very skeptical about that. So I would take a lot of persuasion to give all my passwords to anybody because how good is their security? And you're just not going to be able to successfully audit how good that security is. So, so I'm, I'm skeptical of password management systems. The other thing where it goes wrong is that let's say that password management system might be in the cloud, but it might be some local software on your computers. The, the biggest threat at the moment to most organizations is ransomware. Um, when ransomware hits, the place where all your passwords have been stored might just have been encrypted by the ransomware. So you find organizations get completely crippled because they've now got no access to any of their passwords because they're, they're, they're part of the, the ransomware attack. So again, putting all your passwords in one piece of software, it's, there's, there's a lot of inherent risks there. The, Hence, I like the little book. So is ransomware, is that the biggest threat? You know, if you're a mid-market firm in the UK, somebody somewhere is trying to get malware on your systems so that they can hold you to ransom. Yeah, it's it, it's currently the easiest way to make money for the, for the hackers. It, it's the most it's the easiest to do usually and it often results in people having to pay. So it's 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 just about the easiest way to monetize hacking skills. But the people that hack you normally don't do the ransomware. So they, oh. they'll have different people will will specialize in different things. So the people okay. that specialize in breaking in, they'll break in and then sell that to somebody else. So the ransomware guys will buy access to your systems from the person who's broken in. Okay. And is so that, you, is that, is that a, from their, from your, is, does that, is that a lower level crime or is all these crimes the same, but it doesn't matter because they're all in, some far-flung place and nobody ever yeah, gets prosecuted. Yeah, I mean, it's the, you know, they might be in the room next to each other or they might be in different countries, but there's an online right. marketplace for buying and selling um, stolen details. So, so if, you're, if your forte is finding ways in, the easiest way to monetize that is to sell the access that you've, that you've just gained and then ransomware gangs will buy that access and then they'll, they'll do the ransomware piece because ransomware can be pretty complicated some of the ransomware gangs now run in effect contact centers to give you support in recovering your systems so right. some of them will even give you a ticket reference so right. when you contact them to try and recover your data they'll give you a ticket reference and then if you pay up they'll then give you help and support of how to use the keys that they give you to recover your systems because it's in their interest to be help you successfully recover your data if you pay because if they don't help you recover your data, people like ourselves will start advising people not to pay. And so uh, that's interesting. So I, what, so is ran ransomware is the main reason that people contact your organization going, help? Yes, although we do get, there is a gap because of this 
the person who hacks you might not be the person that does the ransomware. You do get a gap where people think there's a breach or sometimes we detected a breach because we do 24 seven detection services. You have a window of opportunity to spot a breach in progress before it becomes ransomware. Right. And the average there, the gap from first being hacked to ransomware, the shortest we've seen is four hours. So a challenge to respond that quickly. Um, but we've seen the longest we've seen is three and a half years. And an average would tend to be about two to three weeks. Okay. So there's a definite opportunity to spot something going wrong, intervene, find how they got in, block their access, and clean the systems before they've deployed the ransomware. And, and that's a large part of what we're doing now is how do you detect early enough and block the hackers so you don't get into the situation with ransomware. And is that that is that that sort of continuous scanning based on new new vulnerabilities? Yeah, a lot of what we're doing for detection isn't detecting necessarily the vulnerability, but it's detecting the suspicious new activity on the network. Oh, okay, so, so it's, it's, an, inter, it's an internal users. monitoring. Yes. So so what happens is the hacker will find. The, so imagine that, imagine that you get burgled. There'll be something that has led the burglar to think they can gain entry to your house. So that's that initial vulnerability. So they've got in, but then they'll ransack the house. They'll go searching for the house. Now you will have hidden your valuables in an ingenious place. Yes, the jewelry box. Yeah, but the, <laughs> the, skilled, the skilled thief knows the the um, ingenious places that you will hide your things so you might think that you know putting your rings in in your um, fur coat pocket is a smart thing to do when you go on holiday but the fur coat pocket will be the first place the burglar will go and look because they'll know that's the sort of place that people hide rings so it's a similar thing with the hackers the hackers are they break in and then they spend a period of time trying to gain access to where they think the crown jewels will be because they want to encrypt the systems that most damage you and gain access to the heart of your system. So they want to cripple the organization so that you have to pay up. And along the way, they'll try and break your backups. So, so it's not in, if, you, if they encrypt your systems and you can just find out how they get in, stop them, um, which we can do reasonably quickly for most organizations, um, and then you can rebuild your systems from backup then there's no need to pay the ransom. Mm -hmm. So they have two techniques, two things they do to, to stop you doing that. The first one is they'll have already broken your backups. So when you come to um, try and restore data, you find the data's all gone and the yeah. backups haven't been working for weeks. So they'll find ways to break the backups, but they'll also steal some data so that if you don't have to pay to recover the systems, they'll then go, oh, by the way, We've also got a copy of all this data and we release it on the internet if you don't pay us and, and the amount is the same to stop them releasing the data as it is to, to recover your systems. Okay. Okay. So, so what we've got to do is not make the mistakes that let them in in the first place because that's all, every single breach is preventable. So you've got to stop them getting in and then that's just top priority because that's possible. But then you've also got to think, Okay, if something doesn't work, if I'm not 100% great at doing that, somebody still makes a mistake, once they're in, we need to detect them in those first few hours and days so that we can stop it becoming the, the ransomware. Yes, and uh, is there something you can do around backups so that, oh, well, it doesn't matter because then they'll steal some of your data and try and sell it. Um, so you, yeah, oh, oh, but is it worth trying to protect your backups then? It, it is. It is worth <laughs> protecting it because um, the disruption of having ransomware on all your systems, let's say that... Um, well, I, I last, in, in the last couple of months, you had that solicitor's firm that was processing loads and loads and loads of the online conveyancing as uh, the run-up to the change. And they were down, they were out for months. Yeah, and pe people can be down for um, um, for months, and, and some systems are never recovered. Um, but the the speed of recovery can be really slow. So for modern systems with large amounts of data, even if you've paid and got the keys back, the time it takes to get all the systems back up and running can be so disruptive. Um, but the the um, protecting the backups actually the irony is 
the more old fashioned and clonky your backup system, the better it is from a cybersecurity point of view. So if you embarrassingly say, oh, we still we're, remember, right. we're still on tapes. Yes, we're still on tapes and the tapes are all in that safe over there. Then we go, great, because the hackers can't destroy those tapes. So if you've got an old fashioned system that writes to physical media, you're in a much better position than if you've got a more modern integrated backup system, which the more, the more modern systems aren't really backup systems. They're more replicating systems. They, they take data and replicate it into other places, which can be useful for restoring very quickly and efficiently. But it also means that the hacker can see that and will actually go and destroy those, those data stores. So, so the modern integrated efficient backup systems tend to be quite poor from protecting you against ransomware. Okay. Okay. And people are talking a lot about uh, an increased risk of threat or cybersecurity on the back of Russia invading Ukraine. Have you seen, does that seem logical and have you seen any evidence of it or? We've seen a little bit of evidence um, in that we do track. So uh, one of the services we do is protect um, websites from attack. So there's a specific technology called a web application firewall, which is a if you like a, a, a firewall on steroids that can do things to protect websites and we can monitor all the things all the attacks they're blocking and one of the things clients like is to report that by country now it's actually not useful information because if you're getting attacked from russia um you don't know the hackers are based there now there are lots of hacking gangs based in russia um but let's say that, that you you decided to become a hacker tomorrow you would um, hack somewhere in another country and use that to conduct your attacks. So you would probably take over a computer in Russia to you, conduct your attacks from there because then the Russians get the blame. So, so the, the, the last country that the attack came from before it got to you um, isn't necessarily where the hacker's based. But we have seen, there is evidence that we've seen in the last few weeks, an increase in attacks coming from Russia. But our advice to clients is not to do anything different in that if you know you've got a weakness, let's say you had a penetration test and it said this thing's quite vulnerable, fix it, and you haven't, then you should have been fixing it anyway. And the need to fix it now is no different to the need to fix it a month ago. So, so if you've got weaknesses and, and problems, you know, if you've got executives logging into email without multi-factor authentication, that needed fixing and it needed fixing last month just as much as this month. Um, and if you think about it logically, if there were hacking groups in Russia under the direct control of the, of the, of the Russian government, they'd probably be directing them at the moment to hacking um, targets in the Ukraine rather than the rest of the world. So, so logically, just because there's a conflict doesn't mean that, you, that you're more of a target. Um, but we go right back to that the, where we started this, which was the reason you get hacked is because you make mistakes, not because somebody decides to target you. So, so I don't think we should be any more concerned about security now than we were a month ago. Um, it's it's just as important, and it always will be important. And Phil uh, Phil Morgan says on the chat that um, <clears throat> one of the mistakes that he sees in smaller companies is the CEO retaining admin access to all systems, which if you're then targeting the CEO, then gives you admin access to all of the systems. Yes. So 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 I'm the CEO and founder, and I'm quite technical. I, I work as a consultant, and I've got lots of security qualifications. I have no administrative access to any of our systems, um, no administrative access to any monitoring, any client systems. Um, and I haven't had that access um, since we were five employees because there's just no there's just no need for me to have that access so yes um the the in smaller organizations everybody being an administrator and everybody having access to everything just makes that journey from initial hacking you to taking control of everything it just makes that a lot easier yes and, and in fact one of our clients i remember uh, had an incident where the ceo's e ceo's email was hacked but they are an it business uh, who provide IT services to other clients, but um, they are, uh, and what they did is they emailed the CFO and said, you know, da, 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 can you send 5,000 pounds or whatever to, to these people? Could you do it straight away? And uh, 
And actually the CFO said it seemed like a really, you know, it was a well-written email. There was just something that wasn't quite right about it. So, you know, she rang him and he's like, no idea what you're talking about, you know? And then of course dives into his email and realizes that his email has been compromised. So, um, you know, just very, um, very easy for those types of things to happen. What, um, what should, so what if, if you've got, is there a top, is there a list, a sort of descending list of things that people, now that, now that you've uh, made them feel much less secure, um, if they want to go away and do things, I mean, obviously they can, they can call you and you've got a range of services you could supply, but if they're just thinking about what is the list in, dis, in sort of order of priority that they, people should be going and doing? So there's, the, the, there's two things there. If, if they're a larger organization, um, that list and, is and what what does what does what does larger well you know? let's say that they're let's say that they're 250 people plus right okay. organization so they're not really sme but if they're if they're larger than the sme end of the market then their list could be different depending on their situation okay so one of the services we have is what's called a cyber security review where we go on site or work with the people if they're working um, remotely um, and, and come up with those lists for that organization. So we say these are the, the top 10, 15 things you should be doing. Um, and we do a technical report to say these are all the fixes that need to be made. Um, but we also, these lists, we color them in so the executives can understand them. So as an executive, you get, you get your list and you don't need to know what those words mean, but you can understand that the top five things are all red. And then when we repeat the exercise in six weeks and you can see that those top five things have turned from red to green, you know your IT people are doing all the right things to fix them. Um, so, but having said that, that lack of multi-factor authentication on internet logins is usually near the top of everybody's list because it causes so many breaches. Okay. Now, for the SME market, um, it's more challenging because they don't have the level of technical expertise. So, so some, most don't have a cybersecurity expert person, um, which you tend to only get when maybe the IT team gets to maybe 10 people or more. And your average company's IT team is only four people. So most companies are small companies and have small IT teams. So your average company has no internal cybersecurity expertise. Or they've outsourced IT to a local IT support company who also doesn't have cybersecurity expertise. So... It's more challenging for the smaller companies and they don't have the budgets. Um, but one of the things we do is we do some free one hour webinars and we, we do these each month and some of them are specifically for SMEs. So we have what's called the SME roadmap and we take them through eight different things which are the, the key things you should do in the order you should do them. So we've, we've touched on quite a few today. So one is, um, don't let your users use their own personal computers for work because that leads to breaches. Do those simple cost-effective scans to stop people um, um, see, to, to see what the hackers would be seeing. Um, have up-to-date antivirus and spam filtering. So some of these things are really quite cost-effective and, and quite simple things. Um, and then there's also a certification which is really helpful for small businesses called Cyber Essentials. So this is a UK certification, but it's written by um, the um, National Cybersecurity Centre. Right. And, and it, it's a technical standard, but it's designed for small businesses. So, so you don't need to be have too much expertise to implement it, but it's, it's all the things that tend to lead to breaches. So what I say to a really small company, so if you're a small company of, say, 10 users, but your IT is looked after by a local IT support company, I say, okay, take the cyber essential standard and go to them and say, we want you to manage our IT in line with this standard. Um, and they may go, oh, it costs you a little bit more, but at least you've got a benchmark then. And then you can bring somebody like us in and for one day a year mm -hmm. to just come in and review it and say, you're either meeting this standard or not. So it's a really efficient way of making sure that you've done all the sensible things. So cyber essentials, um, there's actually two levels. One's a self-assessment, which is pretty useless. The other is actually being, having it audited once a year. So that's Cyber Essentials Plus. So that's a really good standard for the, um, the smaller organizations. Um, and 
it's it's inflexible, but that's its strength because it tells you what to do. So you don't get choice to risk assess and decide to do things and not some of the other more sophisticated standards, you can tailor it to your organization. Cyber Essentials assumes a small organization doesn't have the experience and skill to know what to do and not to do. So it just tells you what to do. So it's Ian, quite didactic, but that's that's its strength really. Ian, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for coming on and giving us your time today and sharing your sharing with us your wisdom and expertise. That's been it's a pleasure. Uh, been brilliant. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching and listening. And we'll uh, we'll get this up and get the show notes up and contact details for Ian and capture those things like cyber, cyber security essentials and essentials plus in the show notes. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you.